team for that, um, leading us in our worship uh, today. And again, especially uh, Michelle and Kara, thank you for um, leading out in worship today. Appreciate that. Uh, in your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 21, we're going to look at verses 1 through 9 this morning. Matthew 21. Uh, we've had major issues with our PowerPoint today, so hopefully third time's the charm and it all goes smoothly for, for us going from slide to slide this morning. Matthew 21, 1 through 9. This is, uh, Michelle had mentioned earlier about Palm Sunday, and um, this is the scripture about Palm Sunday. Matthew 21, 1 through 9. When they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them, and brought the donkey and the colt and laid their coats on them, and he sat on the coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats on the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. The crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. As we look at this passage of scripture and, and um, this part of um, the book of Matthew, I realize I, I picked a bad time to start um, a series of lessons on the life of Jesus because all of a sudden we have to jump to the very end. Uh, here we are at the very end of his life, and we're going to do that for a couple of weeks, look at some of these scriptures at the end of the Gospels. Uh, I should have probably started this at Christmas time. Then, you know, we could have coincided with the birth and, and all of that. But we'll do that, and then we'll go back um, after um, Easter and, and look at some of these other um, scriptures that talk about the life of Jesus. Seeing that example where he said that he came to serve through Jesus and through other people as well. I also, because of this idea of I came to serve, I almost um, titled this les lesson today, The Donkey Said I Came to Serve, um, or Follow the Example of the Donkey in Your Service, uh, because uh, that's who we see serving here um, in the triumphal entry. You know, we don't talk about donkeys very much, but there's actually a few places in Scripture that um, talk about um, donkeys. We, um, some famous donkeys. We have Balaam's donkey, um, who spoke to Balaam. And we have this one, um, who uh, brought Jesus into Jerusalem. Um, there's other references as well. If you look back in the Old Testament at Ishmael, before Ishmael was born to Abraham and Hagar, remember it was Hagar, not Sarah, um, that God sent an angel and she spoke to Hagar and told her that Ishmael would be a wild donkey of a man. That's how he was described. Um, according to the law, even donkeys rested on the Sabbath, so they, they had opportunity to rest as well. Uh, Samson, we know um, all the exploits that he had, but he took the jawbone of a dead donkey and used it as a weapon, killing a bunch of Philistines in the process. And it, King Saul, before he was King Saul, um, he was out looking for his lost donkeys when he came um, face to face with Samuel, and Samuel spoke to him and then anointed him um, the first king of Israel. Um, and the Old Testament prophecy that Matthew spoke about from Zechariah, he is humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So there's some references to donkeys, some famous donkeys that we find in Scripture. But let's get back to Jesus and talk about this powerful entrance that he makes into Jerusalem. Jesus planned this entrance. We need to make sure we understand this. He scripted this. He wanted to make sure this happened in a certain way at a certain time. He put all of this together to drive home a point. Jesus was, as we know, very popular. He uh, 
Uh, people followed him, you know, the masses were following him. He starts teaching and a large crowd would come. Obviously, when he did miracles, people would come. But Jesus didn't go out of his way to try to get a crowd. He wasn't trying to be flamboyant. He wasn't trying to be a, a crowd seeker. Um, in fact, we know what he would do. He would heal somebody and say, don't tell them what happened to you. Um, and, and many times he would try to get away, away from the crowds so he could spend time with his disciples. But He's going to heal somebody. He's going to teach. And then the crowds all um, get back around him again. So most of the time, when you look at Jesus in his life, he did not do a bunch of things trying to bring in a crowd until today. On this particular instance, he was doing something. He wanted the crowds to be there, and he wanted them to see what was happening and understand the message that he was trying to bring. This day we call Palm Sunday. This is the day that we remember that triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and he uses this particular day um, to proclaim who he is so that in a few days when he dies for everyone, they'll know who it was that died for their sins. And we will know who it was that died for our sins. So who is Jesus? What did he proclaim about himself in this day as he rode into Jerusalem surrounded by all these people? Well, first of all, he proclaimed that Jesus is the Lamb of God. That's who he is. He's the Lamb of God. Now, we started, we, we talked about this last week we, because we were talking about John the Baptist and, and John's ministry and... And then how Jesus was just getting ready to start his ministry. And that's what John said. There's the Lamb of God who, um, to, to, to take away the sins of the world. Um, that's what John said about Jesus. And John was right. Um, that is who Jesus is. He is the Lamb of God. And he did come to take away our sins. Now, many Bible students, they believe that this particular day that Jesus entered into Jerusalem is a day that they call Selection Day. And it's very important as you see all the events that unfold um, during this particular week. This was the day when the families were supposed to pick their sheep for, um, for the Passover, which was going to come later on in the week. And these instructions were given in Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12, verses 3, and then also verse 6. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month they are each one to take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. So there's a couple of dates in there. There's the tenth of that month and then the fourteenth of that month. Now that's not going to correspond with our dates. Um, we have a different calendar, but uh, just a couple things about that. We need to remember those dates. He says at twilight, that's when the lamb was to be um, sacrificed. It was to be killed. Twilight um, would correspond with the evening sacrifice that the Jewish people had every single day. They were at the temple. There was an evening sacrifice. Happened around three o'clock um, in the afternoon. Now, um, if you look at a calendar, you know, like I said, today's the 25th, so it's hard to picture this. But if you get out your phone and look at the year 2018, you'll notice in June, there's a 10th that's on a Sunday. It helps us kind of visualize this a little bit. So if you want to look at that, go ahead. Just don't play any games after that. Um, and so on the 10th, if you look at, if Sunday's the 10th, then the 14th is Thursday. Okay, so you probably figure that out as well. But if Sunday's the 10th, then Thursday's the 14th. And so what we are, and so if we, we put all that together, we recognize Jesus came in on the 10th and he died. We remember his, the Passover meal would have been on the 14th and then he was arrested and, and then died, after, you know, the next, the next morning after that. And so as we look at their dates, this made sense because he would have had that Passover that week, which we celebrate on the Thursday night, and that would have been that Sunday morning. He would have come in on the day that they were supposed to pick the, the lamb that they were to sacrifice for the Passover. Jesus planned this. This was part of his plan because he was doing all this so they would understand the symbolism and the message, all these scriptures, all these ideas from the Old Testament that they knew that they would understand that as it would unfold before them and that 
on selection day, he was the Lamb of God that was selected so that um, he was the one that would take away our sins. Just like the Passover Lamb was given to protect the people from death, we know that Jesus died and he protects us from death and gives us life. Paul even used this idea with Jesus as he talked about Jesus as the Passover lamb. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, uh, Paul says, For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. So Paul uses that same theme as he's talking about Jesus as well. And there's another interesting passage of scripture that helps us kind of point to this particular day and, and this thing that Jesus did. Go way back to Abraham. When Abraham took Isaac up on the mountain to um, sacrifice him, God told him to do it, and he was going to obey God. And so he takes Isaac up to the mountain uh, to sacrifice him. And on the way, Isaac says, hey, Dad, we have, um, we have the wood and we have the fire. Um, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham answered him in Genesis 22, verse 8. Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. God will provide the lamb, okay? Well, we know what happened. Abraham proved to God that he would obey God, and God stopped him from sacrificing his son. And then he looks up, and he sees a ram caught in a thicket. So he takes that ram, and he sacrifices that ram that particular day. Um, and then they head home, and he tells Isaac, don't tell mom anything about this. And um, so then they head, they head back down. So as we... Um, as we think about that story, we, we see that substitute, but he made that statement, okay? That was Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is where they built Jerusalem. Jerusalem is on Mount Moriah, okay? And so that's where Abraham took Isaac up to sacrifice him, but God didn't require that. But on Mount Moriah and on those hills around Jerusalem, all part of that Mount Moriah, that's where Jesus died on the cross as our lamb sacrificed for us. So he became that lamb, and as he was coming in, his, his life coming in on that particular day, um, part of what he was trying to show everybody was he is the lamb of God. That's something that we remember. He was proclaiming that that particular day. Secondly, he was proclaiming his kingship. Jesus is the king. Okay? He is the promised king. He is heir to David's throne. Okay? In, if you go back to the beginning of the Gospels, in the story of, of the birth of Christ, the Magi from the East, they came in asking, where is he who's born King of the Jews? That's what they were looking for from, a, from the very beginning. Jesus was born the King. We go through the life of Jesus and we find places where the people tried to, you know, they wanted to take him and make him the King. And he had nothing to do with that because that wasn't the type of King that he was going to become. And, you know, we know what they were looking for for as a king, someone to uh, protect them and set up a new kingdom and, and all that. That was not what he was going to do. But, uh, but we see they, at times they recognized because they knew about the prophecies of Scripture. They knew about the pictures of the, from the Old Testament of what they were looking for in their, um, their Messiah. Now, on this day, Jesus actually makes the proclamation that he is the king. So he's, again... It's planned. It's scripted. He wants everybody to see this and understand this, that this is who it is that's coming into Jerusalem, that he proclaims that he is the king. He does that by riding on that donkey. And we may not get it, but the people, they got it. They understood. They knew the scriptures, and they knew that scripture from Zechariah. And it's from Zechariah 9.9 that Matthew quotes. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So Jesus was fulfilling that. Matthew recognized it, so he quotes that, that passage of Scripture. And we think, a donkey? You know, why in the world is he riding in on a donkey? Um, why not a horse? Well, horses were a little little more scarce than donkeys. And, uh, and then, again, the things that you read about kings in those days is that if they were going to go into a battle, they may go in riding on a horse. If they come in at a time of peace, they come in riding on a donkey. And so we've read that, and that's what we kind of understand. 
And, and so we see that Jesus is coming in, the Prince of Peace, the, the King of Israel. Um, and also, speaking about a descendant of David, there's something about David that we need to remember as well. We remember his triumphs. We remember the good things about David. You know, a couple of, couple of things with sin as well. But, you know, most of the time when we think about David, man after God's own heart, David and Goliath, David was able to survive and didn't kill Saul when he could have um, and waited until God put him in position um, to be the king, became a great king, a king that the people loved, a king that brought the people back to God and, and led them to follow God. Um, we, you know, we think about those. He brought in the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. I mean, he wanted to build the temple. God says, no, your son will do that. And so he raised the funds for that. We think about all these things with David. David, I mean, the good things. But we may not always remember that David was run out of town by his son, Absalom. See, Absalom wanted to be king, and he didn't care if he killed his father in the process. And Absalom, he was also a young, handsome man, and he was also uh, very friendly and outgoing, and he started doing things for the people to help them. And, and all of a sudden, the hearts of the people started to kind of move away from David. He was off in the palace all the time and, and down to Absalom, and he was among the people, and, and they started to like him. And all before you knew it, Absalom... He had, he had a, a following, and he had an army, and he was ready to become the new king. And so he, he pushed David out of, um, of the palace, ready, you know, ready to kill him. I mean, he was going to search for him and kill his father so that he would be the next king. The Bible tells us that when all this was happening and David realized what was going on, he headed out, and as he left Jerusalem, the Bible says that he was walking and he was weeping with his entourage of people, and they crossed the Kidron Valley, and they went up to the Mount of Olives to begin their exile. So he was leaving, he, thinking that he'd never be king again. Now this is significant, that, that the way he left, weeping through the Kidron Valley, over the Mount of Olives, and then away. The people remember their history, and they remember the prophecies that are associated with all that. Now, we know it's short-lived. Absalom died fairly quickly in this war. Um, David was able to return um, back um, as king and settle back in as king. But for Jesus now to come from the Mount of Olives, through the Kidron Valley, into the eastern side of Jerusalem, through the eastern gate into Jerusalem, this was very significant for the people of Israel. The prophets talked about those things, and they, and they spoke about that. Jesus was entering into Jerusalem by the way of Mount of Olives, Kidron Valley, entering, rejoicing. David left weeping. Jesus comes in rejoicing, this new king being exalted. Jesus knew about that. The people knew all that. And Jesus allowed it to happen because he wanted them to recognize on that day, all these other days he'd never say anything about being the king of Israel, but on that day, he wanted them to know that he is the king of Israel. And it's going to be the king of Israel who's going to die for their sins. And when they think of the king of Israel, they're thinking Messiah. They're thinking of all these things. And that's why the people were doing and saying the things that they, that they did that day. Normally, Jesus had nothing to do with that. Normally, he would not be attracted by these crowds. Normally, he would not tell people to say anything or try to set up to get people worked up about anything. But on this day, he does that because it's very important that we understand who it is that died on that cross and why he died on that cross. He's the king of Israel who would be sacrificed for all of us. So Jesus is the lamb, and he's also the king. Thirdly, Jesus is the man of sorrows. He's the man of sorrows that day. Now, there's an old Easter hymn that we hear, maybe you've heard sung um, at, at times around Easter. Again, it's not something you hear a lot. It's called Man of Sorrows. Um, and Hillsong has is, is, um, produced a newer version of that song with the same title. And the, this old song starts like this. Man of Sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came. Ruin sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Now, I know that Mike Williams, when um, he's preached, and Tony Lamone, when he's preached, that they've, they've actually sung 
uh, during the sermon time. I'm, I'm going to spare you uh, of that today. I'm not going to sing it, but I wanted to say that first verse um, and about the man of sorrows. That, that is a song that, that it, churches have sung during this time of, East, of Easter. The point is, Jesus is approaching Jerusalem, and he is not only the lamb, and not only is he the king, but he's a man of sorrows. Luke points this out. Luke 19.41 when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it. So he's coming through this Kidron Valley that David left weeping, and now Jesus is coming in with these crowds, but he takes this moment to stop, and he starts weeping for Jerusalem. Now, there's a couple places in Scripture that we recognize that Jesus wept. We know about Lazarus at the grave, at the tomb, that Jesus wept. That's the famous one. Uh, but he also weeps here as he's heading into Jerusalem, probably weeping because as much as he's being honored on this particular day, he's going to be harshly rejected in just a few days. He wept because those around him in that crowd, some of them, many of them, most of them would, would reject him and not and not believe on that particular day that he was the Messiah, that um, he was the one that was sent from God. Um, and it's probably in the same way that God's heart still breaks because people will just not believe. They just, they just won't believe the life that God wants to offer us. They won't, they won't believe the, the, the message of love that God wants to give. And, and just like God weeps through that, Jesus wept because of his people that he loved, he knew would reject him. And, then, and eventually, because of that rejection, there would be a judgment against them. And so even in the midst of all of this, he takes that moment and he weeps for the people of Jerusalem. So Jesus was the lamb and he was the king. He was the man of sorrows and also we find that Jesus is the savior. That's very important for us to remember today. He's the savior. That's why he came. And on this particular day, he wanted to, everyone to know why it was that he went to that cross. What, what was the whole purpose of all that? He didn't just die because some Jewish leaders got tired of him and were able to figure out, figure out a way to kill him. That's not why Jesus died. He died on that cross for our sins. And the people that day were proclaiming that Jesus was the Savior, the Messiah, the Savior. That's why they shouted out, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The people cried out, Hosanna. Now, sometimes we forget what that means. Hosanna means save now. If you don't know that, write it down. It means save now. That's what they were proclaiming. They weren't just saying hallelujah. They're saying save now. Now we know what they were looking for. They were looking for the, the new king, the Messiah, to set up a kingdom in Israel um, to make them independent of any other nation and to bring in this messianic reign that they knew about, didn't understand everything about it, but they, they knew about it and were looking forward to that. That's why they were shouting out. Now they were wrong in their assumptions of what Jesus was going to do, but that's what they were calling for. We, we have a savior. Jesus, he is our savior. That's what they were calling out, save now. We know he's saved by going to the cross and dying for our sins. He, he did that for them. He did that for us. He's our savior. He proclaimed that that day and allowed the people to proclaim that that day. And even when the Pharisees were saying, make them stop, he says, hey, the stone's will cry out if they're not crying out, because that was the day of proclamation. That was the day to let everybody know who it is that's coming into Jerusalem and who it is that would eventually go to that cross and die for our sins. He's our Savior. So today, thank the Lamb of God. Thank the man of sorrows that he fulfilled God's plan. Bow to the King of kings, your Lord and Savior, remembering that he's your Savior by trusting in his work that brings out that salvation for us today. That's what Jesus has come to do. That's who he is. That's the one who died on the cross and was raised from the dead, the one that we put our faith in. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that um, on this particular day, uh, you allowed Jesus to make it very clear who he was. 
all the rest of the time, he would, he would never bring this up. But on that day, he did. And I just thank you that we have record of it and understanding of that. And I pray, Father, that we will always remember who he is that died for us and, and, and continue to give you thanks. Thank you for the salvation that you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. As we finish up today, if you have a prayer request or need to make a decision for Christ, we're going to give you that opportunity. So let's go ahead and stand together as we sing.